Thanks everyone for being here. I'm Jeff Cote with Pacific Yacht Systems. Um, today we're going to be talking about boating apps. So there's no installation or wiring or any type of electrical or electronic stuff that we normally do on boats. This is mostly uh, driven about with the advent of technology and all these smartphones and iPads and devices that we have around us and what's really out there and accessible. If anyone has questions, feel free to raise your hand in the back. Uh, or anywhere, and if the sound level I'm not speaking loud enough, which is generally not a problem, uh, let me know. So basically, this is kind of an overview of how we're going to go to with the presentation. So these are the different categories because I mean, there's so many apps about everything. What we try to do is we're going to be talking about navigation, a little bit weather and tides. I'll talk about marine traffic, which is can come through AIS, and I'll explain what that is. We'll talk about control and control what. What are things about safety? A little bit about sailing. I know that it's not the majority of us, but there's probably some of you in there that look at sailing, about anchoring, and then also different types of lifestyle apps, you know, things that you can do. So that's kind of the, generally the direction of the apps. By the way, this presentation is gonna be online tomorrow and posted, um, so send me an email and we'll have a link to it for anybody who wants to actually see the PDFs of this presentation. All right, so basically what are the things to consider when you're looking at a navigation app? Okay, this is basically my disclaimer. I want to emphasize, and, I, and I'm a tech geek, okay? I'm an engineer, I love technology. I was the first one to buy an iPad. I had an iPhone before everyone else. I got the iWatch the first day it came out. I love it, but all of these are gadgets for me. Uh, at the end of the day, I would not say to anyone, let go the chart plotter on your boat and bring your iPhone and navigate with an iPhone and solely an iPhone to somewhere and not be really good at handling marine charts. Now, if you're really good at piloting and your, your chart works amazing, sure, the iPhone's awesome. But if you're putting everything in the basket with just an iPhone or an iPad, things are great until they're not gonna work, okay? Um, nobody at Apple, and I have a lot of my classmates that work there, nobody at Apple is designing the iPad and thinking some boater is gonna be using it to go through a pass and if it ever fails, um, they're screwed and they're gonna crash into the rocks. It's a, it's a recreational type of device. It's not a device that someone builds and thinks that you're gonna put your life into it. So just take it with that grain of salt. It's great to compliment, uh, but I would not trust it at all cost. We recommend it a lot with a lot of our owners to use it as a second helm. It's great as a second helm. Um, the other thing too that you've got a choice about is gonna be able to choose what type of cartography you want on that app. Do you want vector or raster charts? Raster charts are basically photographs of the typical CHS charts that we're all familiar with. It's really just an image. It's a picture of that chart. It's not manipulated, nothing else. They can't screw it up in the digitization. It's literally just an image, that's it. Vector charts are where they actually digitize and literally start doing what's called layering of the information, and all that information is literally manipulable. You can change whatever. You can have the water purple, you can have it pink, you can have the contour lines at 66, 33, 11, you can have them at whatever you want. You can show the land, not show the land, you can show contours, you can show soundings, some soundings, not soundings. You can manipulate the data to however you want it. That's basically a vector chart. There's camps on both sides, there's benefits to both sides, that's the difference between raster and vector charts. The other question you've got to ask yourself is when you buy an app, especially the newer versions, you don't actually have the chart data on the app. You actually have to go online, even after the app is downloaded because they're giving you apps for North America, they're not, you're not downloading North America charts on your phone. There's no way, it's not gonna happen. You've got to choose a section of the charts that you want, download them, because once you're gonna be up in the Browns or Desolation Sound, you might have downloaded the app, but if you don't have the charts for it, you're not gonna be able to use the app. Okay, it's gonna just give you base map. Base map means pretty much within a kilometer you're here and the shore is somewhere there or there. Like you can't use that for navigation. And then the other question you've gotta ask yourself is am I just gonna use a charting app or am I also gonna have an app that has more features in it? So. We'll talk about other apps that start bundling in more than just navigation, but start doing weather, tides, currents, sonar, and different types of apps like that. So this is a screenshot from Navionics. 
and um, Navionics have apps that are <coughs> on an iPad, I mean Android, everyone, they, they have in all devices and you can actually see it as well. And you can see the, that this definitely looks different than a raster chart. It's a vector chart. This is a chart that's been digitized. For some people, it looks more newer, more technology. Other people like more the familiar look of a raster chart, okay? I'm going to be dividing the presentation. There's a lot of information, there's a lot of apps. So normally in a lot of different settings we do handouts, but with the Bocho I never know how many people are going to show up. So uh, that's why it's going to be online and you can print it off. The really one that I really like is the Garmin blue chart. Garmin's so big that they actually don't buy charts, they make their own, right? When you're that big, you do what you want. For them, it didn't make sense to give anybody else the money. So they have their own charting in-house. And it's called blue charts. Some people swear by it. Um, one other thing that I like about the Garmin blue chart, I use it to offset my Navionics because they're both independently creating their own vector charts from the paper charts. So it's kind of a duplication of efforts. If they both agree and they came to the same conclusion independently, most likely the island that you see in two places on two different systems is probably there, right? But if they missed one and you see it on the other one, then you're wondering, well, is the island not there or is it there? Because honestly, there are errors. And that's the, also the caveat with anything where there's people involved. This digitization is done by someone. And that someone, it's very tedious and they're going to miss stuff. And so there was an article in PY just recently about a vector chart that didn't have all the right information. I've seen it. I've been in places in the Browns where there's an island bigger than this room, simply not there, right? Twice the size. And it's got height. It's not a shoal. It's like trees on it, the whole nine yards. And it was not on the charts. So that's the great thing about when you want to choose apps. You might decide to choose complementary apps, especially in places where you don't feel familiar with the waters, right? iNavX is getting a lot of traction. It's pretty much the ubiquitous, it's almost the noble tech version of navigation software for smart devices. They're really, I mean, it's, it's, a full, it's basically noble tech, except for your iPad. That's what it is. But you can see also the price point, and this is probably going to adjust because these price points were taking late fall. So the App Store is adjusting their price point with our dollar. But these were prices, they've probably all gone up now. Uh, you can see that's the most expensive app you can buy, but you're buying a lot, like Noble Tech, on an iPad, okay? Notice that it actually support AIS. Doesn't mean that it's getting AIS without a black box device, and I'll talk about why the benefits of AIS would make sense, especially for someone that doesn't have another chart plotter, right, or anything else. This is the end all be all. AIS on your iPad might be a really good idea. Going back just quickly to the Garmin blue chart, notice how it has built-in weather. So what that means is actually Garmin also, so big, has their own weather service. They don't buy weather service from a third party. They actually have their own weather service. They're in avionics. Weather is part, big part of avionics. And what you can do actually for, I think it's a token amount, one or two dollars, you can add on a feature where you have unlimited weather data forever. What that means, that weather data is not coming you know, through words in a VHF where you gotta, gotta figure out where the fronts are, the winds, the wind direction, and you gotta translate that and figure out what you are. They're showing you wind wave, wind, wind direction, wave height, through time, with barometer lines, the whole night pressure gradients, everything happening right there on top of the chart. So anybody that's into either going in places where you know, there might be you know, straight of Georgia, and you want to figure, okay, are the, where's the swell going to be coming from, right? What kind of seas am I going to be getting in 12 hours, six hours? Instead of listening to forecasts and trying to figure out what all that means, you can literally do play. And it's going to show you the wind direction, wave heights, everything right on your iPad. So that for $2 one-time fee, I would call that a deal, all right? But you need, obviously, the internet to get that data. I mean, it's not uploaded. You need to be able to get that constantly down to get the latest weather data. Marine charts, you can see NOAA gives charts away for free in the States. Um, so there's apps that just take that data and simply put it up. And NOAA, the NOAA charts are uh, raster charts. 
So it's a little bit like CHS, but CHS in Canada doesn't give them away. You still have to buy them. That's why charts in Canada always cost more. Navionics is probably the ubiquitous app that it's the first, you know, really to come into the market. You've, most of you, if you're in a boating and you have friends, that's the app they've showed you. Like, let's be honest, the market penetration on that app is outstanding. They were first to market. Uh, their price point has always been very reasonable. And over time, they're giving you more and more feature sets. And on top of it, now you used to buy, when I bought it initially, you only got British Columbia. Now it's like you buy North America and you download the charts you want for where you're going. I mean, that's pretty sweet. So if you're in here in the summer and you're gonna rent a boat in the BVIs, you can probably assume, unless you're spending huge dollars, that the chart plotter on board is gonna be really bad. But if you want a nice chart plotter on board on a charter boat in the BVIs, you buy the app, you download the charts before you head there, suddenly you've got the, a way better chart plotter than a charter company is gonna be offering you. So it can be convenient. We did that when we went to Croatia, we sailed for two weeks in Croatia, and obviously I expected the chart plotter to be terrible, it was. And we came in and we had both the Garmin Blue Charts and Navionics, and we were using both just to give us you know, a little bit more comfort in the cruising grounds, because I had never been there, nobody had ever been there that I spoke to, so I was going there just simply with the charts. TZ Touch, um, and you see that they've parted with uh, Time Zero. Time Zero is from Furuno, Noble Tech bought, Furuno bought Noble Tech, so they've partnered up and done an app. Newer to the market, not as old as uh, uh, the one that I was showing you previously, which is um, iNavX, but you can't go wrong with Noble Tech. Noble Tech is world class. I mean, we're working on a 145 right now, and the captain was absolutely adamant that he absolutely needed Noble Tech on board for the Caribbean and North America. You know, and so there's really no budgets in those boats, and he swore by Noble Tech. And he's a, like a real, like, he's a true mariner. So Noble Tech has a lot of credibility in the market. It's a great product, and that's an easy way to get Noble Tech type of software, again, on an iPad without having to pay the huge licensing fees that you'd have to do to run it on a computer. You can see all the, um, they do 3D charting. You've probably seen their ads. It's pretty creative what they're doing with the charts as well. Pretty powerful. And then the bottom one is Digital Yacht. Digital Yacht is at the forefront of integration. They're the kind of the whiz kids of everything that has to do with the integrated boat. They're based out of the UK. They've got amazing product offerings that are reasonably priced. It's just they do, they're really pushing the boundaries of everything working together. And you can see all the different types of information that they're trying to aggregate and make available onto your chart plotter. So they're actually gonna pull in depth, speed, all this information that you might have on your backbone that's NMEA or NMEA 2000, and they're gonna take it and send it over Wi-Fi to a device. So instead of having just instrument repeaters in your boat, you're suddenly gonna have a device that has everything that's on your boat, all tight of data like wind speed, all this other stuff, now is showing up on your iPhone or on your iPad. So it's basically making your smart device an instrument repeater, multi-function and instrument repeater. But it doesn't stop there. You know, you can start having AIS, range bearing, <laughs> tides, like, it's basically the end result. I mean, it's the all in one, okay? All right, so this is going in a little bit Navionics. This is the look and feel of the Navionics app. I'm not gonna talk of everyone like that, but I'm highlighting the look and feel. You can see the different type of information you can have. They've also now added Navionics weather. It was used to not be there, but now with Garmin, Garmin was taking market share from that because it's kind of nice to have no weather at the, especially within if your cell range, right? To know weather without having to listen to a VHF channel is kind of like, it's endearing, let's be honest. Um, and the other thing too that's amazing about those apps, and I use them all the time, is I get this question from crew and from my wife all the time. How long is it gonna take us to go from here to there tomorrow? That is the most common question. It's what I used to do with my dad. When, are we, when will we be there? How long? How long is it gonna take? What time do we have to leave? All those questions. And before to do that on paper is extremely time consuming. You gotta, especially if you're North Island or Mid Island, and you got passes to go through, 
right? Or even the Gulf Islands, what time are you gonna be at a pass? Depending on the boat you have, you might have to be there at Slack. What's great about that is you can literally within like 15 seconds, you can know exactly the distance from A to B, but not by bird flight, but by literally a safe route. And so if you're passage planning, you can say, well, we can go there tomorrow, there tomorrow, there tomorrow, there tomorrow, 17 miles, 22 miles, 11 miles, eight miles, right? And then they'll tell you, because you enter your boat speed, it's gonna take us blah, 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 right? They'll do the math for you. And then after that, on top of it, you can look at the passes as well. If we go there, we wanna go Octopus Islands from you know, Desolation Sound, you're in Preto, we gotta go through a pass, are we gonna hit the pass at the right time? What time do we have to leave? All those things can be done instead of at the, actually at the helm, because most chart plotters do that. You can just simply do it on your iPad, on the aft deck, you know, in the cabin, wherever you wanna be. You could be in your dinghy, it doesn't matter and you can route that, and you can do that without the internet. That outer routing capability is actually built in once you've downloaded the charts. Okay, so that's a big win for passage planning. Really like it, and this is definitely, you can also see it does tides, right? So I use it for anchoring all the time. Yes, I have a tide book that I buy every year. I have one. How often do I look at it? Never, but I have one. And I look at tides on there to just figure out, okay, what's the tide, you know? I've got a sailboat, six foot draft, you know, am I gonna be swinging, what's boom, boom, make sure I'm all good, ties are not gonna be too low, I'm fine, and then that's how I make my decisions, okay? You see blue chart, um, same thing, some people swear by Garmin, right, and they're used to the feel of Garmin chart plotters, this would be a way to get blue charts, right, so it's consistent with what you have on your boat. Other owners really like They'll maybe have Remarine or Simrad or Furuno, but they want something else. Again, it would be good to complement with a different technology. Again, for those, especially if you're going places where you, maybe in west coast of Vancouver Island, there's different places, Bunsby's, these places where it's a little sketchy, right? It's a little bit nerve wracking. It's not clear navigation. It's not like going Malaspina. If you hit land, you're, there's no rock in between, you know? Like, so this might be a good to give you a little bit more uh, comfort that you know the lay of the land on top of the paper charts that you have to have on board, of course. Okay, all right, TZ Touch. You can see how the, at the bottom, what they're doing, Faruna is known with doing some really amazing um, animation or manipulation of the vector chart data and also the satellite imagery that they get from Google Maps and put on top. And you can see a little bit what it looks like. I mean it, it almost becomes cartoonish, almost in some ways. So for some of us, that's great. For other ones, maybe not so much. All these things are layers. You can turn them on or off. But for some of you that have Furuno on board or really like that technology, or Furuno is generally very expensive. Um, it is the most expensive. And you can't afford a Furuno on your boat, but you want to have the feel of it, this would be a good way to get it at a reasonable price. All right. So what are the things that you, like what I was saying about weather, I'm gonna go through weather. Well, you can figure what's the weather looking forward, right? You can get wind alerts on your phone, right? Which is nice. And you can get also marine weather. Um, as a sailor, I use uh, wind, especially we do a lot of crossings, our boats in Secret Cove. So as soon as we, we were there, we're either going up Malaspina or across the Lesquiti. And so we're always going, it's not really protected. So I always have to be looking at the wind. What is it gonna to be today, tomorrow? The day after tomorrow? Because if we come back and it's blowing southeasterly 35 on the south point of Texada, it's not gonna be pleasant. So this would be ways for you to start figuring out what are you gonna do this weekend? What am I doing tomorrow? Should I be here, should I not? Do I stay here, do I leave? And these are all apps that you can use for getting weather data. Now. Remember, all of this is dependent on obviously a weather uh, internet connection. So either you have need a hotspot on your boat with another phone, right? But you need some way to get to the internet because that information has to be pulled from the internet. One thing I really like, I don't know if you guys are familiar with this, but NOAA World Radar is pretty cool because radar actually, you can use radar to actually tell where the rain is. And so you'll never hear a weather forecast for what's telling you when it's south point of Winter Cove and Saturna, 
There's not enough people living on Saturna for the radio to ever tell you what the weather on Saturna is. There's 100 people there in the winter. But it's a nice place to be because it's got the lowest amount of rain in all of southwest British Columbia. So you could be someplace and you look at radar and you're like, look at this. There's not a single cloud on top of Saturna right now. Right? Why don't we leave and go to Winter Cove or Tumbo and Cabbage? Right? We're go there. It's not raining. I'm tired of the rain. On North Island, you might be, I don't know, Wallace Island or you're at Telegraph Cove and it's raining there and you're like, because you know the weather changes dramatically here within a short distance and nothing gets stuck there. It just always flies, you know. So you might be looking at that or you might be sometimes we're south and we're like, oh, why don't we go to Tribune Bay? We want to go to the beach there. Oh, well, yeah, look at the weather. It looks really clear there. It's fine. Right? And so you can actually tell that figuring out where you've got rain anywhere at any given time. Same thing if you've got a really fast boat or a tender. This would be a way to go get some sunshine. If you're stuck in Desolation Sound and you want to go get some sun, this might be a way to get yourself somewhere pretty quickly. Tides. Now, tides is where you don't actually need the internet. Tides is a weird thing. It's a 20-year cycle. It's predictable. Uh, so you can actually pretty much download the tide data and they'll be able to tell you what the tides are going to be you know, in a, three years from now based on it's just repetitive. All right. AIS. So what is AIS? AIS stands for Automatic Identification System. And it's basically a protocol for data transfer or data sharing of boat information over VHF frequencies. What does that mean? That means that vessels, by law, type A or grade A, are actually transmitting a lot of information over the air, not via internet, no cell connection, no Wi-Fi. Over the air, they're transmitting who they are, where they're going, their current speed, their current course on ground, their length, their width, everything about the boat, like probably 20 different values, and they're transmitting that like every like two seconds or something, all the time. That's being transmitted over the air. If you're a boater and you have a class B receiver only, you can receive that information and you can show that up on the radio, on the device, on a chart plotter, and you can actually see those targets on your chart plotter. Now, there are apps that show this information, but this is why I'm taking a few seconds or minutes to give you a caveat. Because remember, your iPhone is not getting this information from over the air. There's no VHF antenna. It sounds silly, but I have to say it. There's no VHF antenna on your iPhone or your iPad. The information is being received somewhere on a land based station, taken from that land based station, sent out to a third party. Then your app goes and gets it from that third party and shows it on your iPhone. So there's a delay. Okay? And there could be a longer delay than you would think. It's not always, it could be in real time, but sometimes it might not to, because at the end of the day, there's a lot of different pieces of the puzzle. So if you're looking at an AIS app on your phone, it's cool, it's nice. Oh, look, John and Joanne are up in Montague, and they've arrived. Oh, we'll see them there this weekend. Yeah, we should be going. Oh, look, they're not here now. Yeah, I guess they went to Royal Van Outstation on Salt Spring. We won't see them. That's nice, but to use an AIS app on your phone to try to avoid collision avoidance with a freighter bearing down on you at the southern point of Harrow Strait, and you're using that, and you're like, no, honey, we're really fine. It says that it's not here. Yeah, you see it really close, but the app says it's like a mile over would be a, a showstopper, okay? So really, really important to use AIS on your phone as a kind of a gadget. Okay, like I have clients that do it. Um, for example, you can see there's a lot of boats in Cole Harbor that are actually showing their location. And I have a lot of my clients that, you know, they're on the road and they just want to know where their boat is. It's part of like, you know, we all love our boats for the most part. You know, they're in South America, they're working on a project and they just, they look on their phone, uh, yeah, my boat's still in Cole Harbor. You know, it's like a pulse, right? It's like a heartbeat. That's what it is, right? Now, they're not, exp they're not using this on their phone to navigate, to make decisions. Am I going to go left or right? The tug's bearing down on me. No, that's not what you're doing. You're doing it for, oh, look at this big boat going down the Fraser River. 
I wonder what it is. Oh, look, it's MV this and this coming from Shanghai, going to this port. That's the kind of information, or a mega yacht. They might go on silent, but maybe not, right? And then you can see, oh, look, these boats are coming down. And the other thing you can use it for is, um, yeah, probably that would be the uses that you would do with your iPhone. In real life, you can use AIS for navigation because it's not like radar. Radar, you can only see what you see, right? I mean, it can't go through a mountain. But with AIS, I can light up AIS, for example, at Captain's Cove, and I'm going to see ships in Burrard Inlet. I light it up at my marina in Secret Cove, and I'm going to see the ferry on the north on Powell, Powell River side. There's no way that anything can see anything from Secret Cove to Powell River. It's impossible, but there's a ferry there, and I'll actually see it on my chart plotter. So it's over the air, right? So it'll go on top of a mountain. I mean, it doesn't go endless distances, but you light up a chart plotter in, again, uh, Captain's Cove, and you can see traffic on the southern point of Saturna. So it gives you an idea of the reach. And so what's great about it is you can see traffic on a pass before you get to a pass. And if you see, let's say, for example, you go North Island, you got a lot of passes that are pretty tight. And you, sometimes there's convoys of Westports 110s, right? I mean, there's bigger boats as you get up. And you're like, am I going to be able to squeeze through or Dodds Narrows, right? You're going through Dodds, and there might be a few commercial traffic waiting on the other side. And before you get to it, you can see, oh, look at that. There's like four tugs waiting in line on the other side. And they're going to tell you their length and what they're doing. So it gives you a little bit of information to passage plan a little bit better. Okay. So these are the different apps that you have. Shipfinder is a big one. Again, that's probably the most popular one. If a friend's ever shown you a boat, it's probably the one he's shown you the boat with. Um, and then Boat Beacon. But again, I. It's, it's more like a boat watch. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, so you're only seeing other boats that are AIS equipped, right? You're Correct. No, no, that's right. That's a good point. Remember, this is only other boats that are transmitting their information. There's two types of transmitters. There's class A. They have to. It's a non-option. It's non-negotiable. By law, they have to transmit. So they're, they're real boats, basically. And there's class Bs. These are people that are more pleasure boats. Right? The variety of them. They could be also smaller work boats that choose to, uh, I guess, transmit their location and their information to other boats. It's gaining popularity. Before, years ago, I used to only see boats that would be class A only, and if everyone else would just get class B receivers. But now there's an uptake in class B transmitters, especially boats that are bigger or faster. You know, boats that are, they might be going, okay, well, you know what? I've got friends. I want them to know where we are. And you have a silent button too. You can say, well, this weekend I'm going incognito. You shut it off and you don't see it. So there's options that you can do, but it, it is gaining popularity. There's more and more boats taking on class B receiver transmitters and transmitting their information to other vessels so they everyone sees each other. Okay. The other thing it does also, I just want to say, is over time what it does is it's like with MARPA. You know, in MARPA with radar, you have to actually acquire targets to see if you're on a collision course. If you've got AIS on board and well, you don't even have to have AIS. If you've got an AIS class B receiver, your chart plotter will actually, if it's connected to an AIS receiver, will actually calculate if this freighter bearing down on you coming at 24 knots, because that's what they're doing when they're rounding you know, Saturna on the southern point, and you're in the middle of the Strait of Georgia, and you're looking, you're like, oh, honey, we're fine. You know, that thing's bearing down at 22, 24 knots, right? Like it's a speedboat, right? And you're thinking, oh, we're fine. You want to know, should I slow down, or am I going to miss it? Right? You can, there's different ways you can do it via piloting skills to know if you're on a collision course. I'm not going to tell you that because it's not my place, but there's ways of figuring that out just with, there's ways. But if you want to have better security, what you can do is you can look at AIS data, and AIS data is actually going to look at your course on ground, your speed on ground, their course on ground, speed on ground. Assuming everything stays constant, are you on a collision course? And they'll alarm on that collision course. Say, I want a three nautical mile warning on a collision course. You wouldn't turn that on in the river because you'd be on a collision course with every single boat every minute, right? But you got to remember that when you disable it, you got to re-enable it when you get to Sandheads and you're doing a crossing to, for example, Active Pass, right? All right, so control. What does control mean? Control means what the manufacturers have been doing, and we're seeing a lot of traction on this, is 
Manufacturers have been creating, obviously, chart plotters, which are now called MFDs, multifunctional displays, which means it's a device that does anything. It's got radar, you know, charts, sounder, all this different thing. Years ago, and this is like four, Raymarine came out with an app that you could actually view what was on the chart plotter. So it was kind of a repeater. It was a big deal, by the way. It was the E7. It was like unbelievable. So suddenly, as an owner, you could have one chart plotter somewhere, and if you just want a repeater station, just repeater, that you can't engage or do anything with, you could literally see everything that's happening on the E7 on your iPad, which is kind of neat. So if your budget you know, doesn't allow you to have two chart plotters, lower upper helm, you could have an upper helm chart plotter and then an iPad at the lower helm, right, that you're normally not at the lower helm and leave it there and you can see whatever's there is up there. So not bad and it's, well, it was free. So it's, you know, no brainer if you had an iPad. Over time, what they've done is they've said, okay, not only are you able to repeat information, but you can physically control the other device remotely. Meaning you can turn on the radar, turn it off. You can look at the radar page, just one second, look at the sounder page. You can move your boat, you can not move the boat, but move the screen, pan away, look at another area, zoom in, zoom out. You can do anything you want, like if you were at the chart plotter or MFD. So what's happening is owners that used to be on the fence or bringing a chart plotter, I've got owners that say, Jeff, I'm at the flybridge 95% of the time, but sometimes I go down below. Before it was like, I don't feel like buying a second chart plotter for the lower helm when I'm there 95, it's another three, four, five thousand, it hurts, 2,000, like what can I do? Or for those that don't really have equal use of both helms, they might decide, well, I'm gonna save some money. I mean, we can't do all we want. And they might say, well, I'll put it up at the upper helm, which is where I am all the time. I'll get an iPad and I'll use it as a repeater station, control station at the lower helm. And if I'm ever down there, it's either that or nothing, right? So that's how they look at it. You have a question. Yeah, absolutely. Built-in Wi-Fi within the display, so you don't even need to create your own network. So there's a Wi-Fi that's actually within the device, and it sends that signal out. And this, but you got to remember too. Like I have this. On, of course, I have this. I had this on my boat, but it's not always, I sometimes lose the Wi-Fi connection, right? A boat has tons of RF, tons of RF. I sometimes lose the connection. But you see on my boat, it's a gimmick, right? It's cool, yeah, it's fun. But if I lose it, if the screen freezes, something happens, I'm not saying I'm down in the lower helm and it's gonna take me 30 seconds to go to the upper helm because the stairs are steep, it's flying seas, I don't know where I'm going and I'm down here and I was putting all my trust into this iPad and now I lost a Wi-Fi signal and it froze and I'm really in trouble. 99.9% .9 of the time it won't matter, but you know those places, we know those places where sometimes it's not the place to lose a hand, right? And so that's where again through Murphy's Law, you know how it is, it always seems to be happening when you need it, where you've got to make a decision of how badly do you need that second helm? And if it's more kind of a, oh, nice to have, than a control station, and those apps, and the reality is they're free. So if you buy a new Raymarine system or Garmin system, you'll actually have that. You just download the app, and depend, if some chart plotters have Wi-Fi built in, some other ones it's a module, because it's an add-on. Garmin on their top end, it's, it's built in. Lower end, it's a little module you put in for 100 bucks. Then you just simply buy, you don't buy the app, you download the app, and suddenly you're controlling everything on that chart plotter. You could be anywhere, you could be on your back deck, you could be in your cabin, now for navigation, it's not that practical, I think, from a safety perspective, but at night, winds are hauling, you're at an anchor, it's sketchy, right? It's really starting to be sketchy. Suddenly it was calm day, it's blowing 35, woolly walla, qualcomm wind, you know, bolts are dragging, or you wanna be in the cockpit, in the wind, in the rain, with everything going, or what you do is you turn that on, you have radar overlay on a chart plotter, you're in your salon, and you're seeing your boat swing at anchor. Suddenly now you're seeing literally all the other boats in the bay, because you've got radar overlay. You're seeing if they're dragging on you. You're like, yeah, he's still there. Yeah, she's still there. Oh yeah, they're still there. Good, right? You're swinging, you're swinging. You're painting the bottom, right? You're like, yeah, I'm still in the same arc. I'm not constantly going like this, which would mean you're dragging. 
all those things are nice, and you're doing that without actually being at the helm when it's cold, raining sideways, and there's a storm. You're doing this inside the boat, and you've got full access to your chart plotter without being outside. So these are all the different apps. You can see, like, I mean, all the companies have them, right? Garmin, Maritron is another one, Lorant, Simrad, Ray Control, Furuno. Furuno for our first watch is, is also, it allows control of a Wi-Fi radar. They were the first to make that. I didn't put B&G in there, but B&G has one too for you guys that have sailboaters. Sailboats, if you have a B&G system, they do it too. For new first watch was the first to do a Wi-Fi radar. So I put one on on a boat last year. Klein didn't want to display, wanted a low cost radar for the rare times in July and August that they get caught in the fog. For him, it never happened, it happened once. He got scared, he's like, okay, I'll put radar, but I want to be really low cost. So we ended up putting a Wi-Fi radar on board. So there's absolutely no display other than power cables going to that radar. And the radar is shown on an iPad only. There's no option for anything else. So it's not for everyone, but for him, it was a low cost option to get a radar. Again, a trade-off, okay? The next thing I'm gonna talk about is, I guess, safety apps. There's all these different things. I remember when we did Vancouver Island years ago, we went around Vancouver Island, we had all these different boats on, you know, uh, first aid, first aid for this, first aid for that. Now what they're doing is you can download a bunch of first aid apps right on board. So instead of having these thick books, you know, maybe, you know, space is limited or you just simply don't feel like having a library on board like we do. Uh, you can start buying these different apps. You've got even one like I would, you know, maybe I would, some people love their pets, you know, some people don't. You want an app for what happens if your dog gets sick when you're in the middle of nowhere, there's an app for that. There's apps for everything. I mean, it's, it's just absolutely unbelievable. The really nice one is, uh, that I'd like to highlight is the uh, RCM SAR one. I think that's really cool. Um, and they do good work for our waters, right? All volunteer based. For sailors, there's different apps in terms of uh, sailing rules, regatta, you can see that's pretty, giving you a sense of you know, what's the time to tack, right, to get to your destination. You want to go to A and you're, the wind's coming from B, boom, how, are you sh how should you get there, how long should your tax be? This would help. So there's different ways you can see. Now, this is maybe not so much just for sailors, but interesting. Grip files, I'm not sure, has anyone ever heard the word grip files here before? All right, well, grip files are actually what the weather forecasters use this data this is actually the, the pressure gradient charts that you see. They're actually using, that's what a grip file is. Okay, so weather forecasters, or not weather forecast, weather forecasters, and also I guess um, route planners, right, for people that go ocean voyaging are actually using grip files. And I have clients that do, um, for example, Vic Maui. They're gonna have SSB on board, and they're one of the main reasons they're gonna have an SSB on board is so that they can have a, uh, modem and that modem is going to be used to download grip files. With the grip files you can actually see the pressure gradient where you are because you're downloading further area and you actually see the contours lines and from there you can see the fronts. You'll see all the information that is used to figure out what's happening and they're going to use that information to figure out because they certainly don't go from A to B in a straight line. Right? That's not how they win. Right? So they're going to be using different winds. They might go way more south. They might veer in and there's all these, it's complicated. And so the people that figure out how to go from A to B efficiently use grip files. And grip files, if you're curious, is the information that actually weather forecasting is based out of. So if you're into the wool weather thing, this would be basically the elemental knowledge you need to have or information you need to add to actually create those forecasts and to figure out what's gonna happen with the weather. Starwalk is pretty cool, I mean, let's be honest. You know, you've probably seen those apps that you can look in the sky and they know the orientation and you'll know all the constellation. That's pretty awesome. It's like having a dad that knows all things and there's no BS. You know, what's that? <laughs> all right, uh, anchor watching. Melissa, the office, really loves drag queens. She thinks it's hilarious. What does that mean? Um, basically means that when you actually anchor and you enable these apps, they're gonna figure out a, I guess a diameter from the place that you told them that the anchor held bottom. 
right? Now this is a caveat. You can hear from the tone that I'm trying to use here. The assumption is the moment you say go and you put out your, your distance from where you dropped, that that's where the anchor held, right? So you're gonna possibly have false positives with these apps because the circle that you think you're gonna rotate in, your anchor might have not held the moment you dropped it. It might not have held only five feet as you dragged. It might have dragged 60 feet before it started holding. And now your circle of 100 feet isn't where you thought it was, it's here. So you could easily get yourself out of that circle when it thought that you were here and you were doing a circle, right? Under tension, under wind. So just be prepared that the apps will sometimes give you false indication that you're dragging, not because you're dragging, but because it actually didn't know exactly where the center of where your boat is, right? It's not that easy to know where your anchor is holding the bottom and to know that exactly. Like if there was an app that could tell you, yeah, your GPS anchor is at these coordinates, that'd be perfect, you, you know, that'd be the dream, right? But unfortunately it's in the water and there's no GPS sensor that can be reading in 60 feet of water and then transmitting that information to something else to tell you that it's changing its location. So it's an approximation and it's another tool. Now, other thing to remember is that while you're doing that, the GPS sensor on your phone which every phone has a GPS sensor and iPads with cellular connectivity have a GPS sensor built in. If you leave them on all night and you can't close the phone, they're gonna be drawing a lot more power. And so what you need to do is you need to plug them into a USB port so that the next morning, your phone is still powered up. And that's also the issue with all of this and I didn't even make mention of it. It's easy to use an iPad and an iPhone when the water's perfectly calm, those blissful days that you go across the Strait of Georgia and it's calm and you could w foot water ski across and the only thing you see is your wake, of course, everything's awesome. Those, you probably don't even need anything those days. But imagine yourself if you only have that app and it's like a six, eight foot swells, beam seas, right? And the wind's building and your iPad last night was not plugged in, right? Now you're using it a lot. It's flying around in the cockpit. You can barely hold on to the helm, right? That's the nice thing about having. So if you're really committed to an iPad, get a RAM mount. Get something that can be physically, you put your iPad in there and it's not gonna move in the worst of conditions. Make sure there's a port there to plug it in, right? If you're gonna put a lot of your eggs into this navigation stuff, I'd suggest having close USB, you know, socket, 12 volt cigarette lighters, so you can plug it in, so that it can stay powered, right, as you're using it. You were, the crossing was supposed to take three hours, because you were supposed to go 20 knots. Now the crossing is taking you, you're going only eight knots. You had delays, there's fog, now you're going four, there's still seas. You know, the worst case scenario, that happens rarely, but does happen. You gotta ask yourself, like, when things are really gonna go bad, Am I set to be able to handle them, okay? Um, as we go in right now, we're talking about different types of lifestyle apps. And what we're trying to say is there's a lot of things, like for example, on my boat, Sailor, you know, I don't, I always try to do better at making knots. These are different types of apps for that. Um, there's another one too that's really interesting for people that don't know this. This is really big deal. And probably one of the coolest things that is happening in the marine world is called Active Captain. So you're asking, what is that? Active Captain is like Wikipedia for boaters. It means it's a community of boaters that are sharing about their environment, various things about their local cruising knowledge to one another. And what it means is it's not the word of God, but it's certainly not to be discounted. Meaning all these, and most people, most boaters you would say as a subset are a pretty good bunch of people. You see it the way we share at marinas, at docks, at anchorages about one another, about local knowledge. Active captain is a way to capture that information so that your network isn't just verbally with your close circle. It's literally tens and tens and tens of thousands of people documenting that information so it can be seen by anybody else. And you can see it for free online, okay? 
So they'll tell you, oh, by the way, this reef isn't here, it's there. The marker that's on the chart isn't there anymore. It's blown away, it's gone. There's no more marker. And, they, and, and the government hasn't replaced it. So all those things are things that are actually viewable on Active Captain. Garmin, for example, is actually adding it as a layer within their blue charts. So you can actually have blue charts and you say, I want to have an active, active captain layer on top. So you're like, take it off, put it on. And so then it's going to show you information by your peers, right? So it can be a handy, again, for going in places that aren't places that are super familiar. And that would be handy to do, OK? The other thing, too, in there is uh, TeamViewer. We use that. I use that with people at work. Your ability to log into your computer remotely. You can have a TeamViewer app on your iPad, and you can log into your computer at work. And if you, for example, we use QuickBooks in our business, I can go in with a TeamViewer app and I can log, in, log into my computer at the office and I can go into QuickBooks, I can generate reports. It's like being at my computer, but I'm on an iPad on my boat. So certain apps don't come with you on an iPad. There are certain apps that need a server, they need to be at the office. Whatever those are, you would have the ability of actually seeing files, doing whatever. How, it's literally like being, it's exactly a little bit like the control app that I was talking about. It's a full control of your computer remotely. Dropbox, really popular, it files anywhere. Um, people do yoga on boats, I've seen it. I wish I was that good. Um, workouts, I mean it's endless. And this is just a sample. We started it with 200 apps. All right, well, thank you, everyone. And if anyone has questions, I, I'll be at the back of the room, okay? Thank you. Thank you.